All right, everyone, we're going to jump right into our next session, uh, which is presented by Annette Martinez, which is the Senior Vice President with State Farm. Annette has been with State Farm for 30 years, and her current role as Senior Vice President includes company-wide oversight of diversity and inclusion, corporate responsibility, human resources, public affairs, and learning and development. Um, she will be discussing, are we listening? State Farm's journey to open and honest discussions with employees. Annette, I'll have you take it away from here. Great, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here and um, excited to be visiting with you today as well. Um, so just to give you a little bit of history about my background and what I've been doing, you can read my bio, but I think just to set context for today is um, I have been with the company over 30 years and uh, while I've worked in all different areas of the organization, I've spent over half of my time in the human resources function. So um, at this point, as a senior vice president, I have responsibility for what I say, all things people and community related. So think of human resources, learning and development, corporate responsibility, public affairs, um, and until just this year, in fact, had uh, oversight for the diversity and inclusion work and still work closely with that team too. So um, I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago about speaking with the human resources group um, through this um, forum and had a chance to talk a little bit about some of our, the things that didn't go so well perhaps as we thought about diversity and inclusion over these years. And in 2002, I was asked to start the diversity initiatives for State Farm and for the most part have been actively involved in that work. And, and like I said, until just recently as I've handed over that work. Um, and quite frankly, I was going to talk about something different um, as we started here. So I'm not gonna have any slides because I wanna just have a conversation. Um, and what really changed my thinking is um, a session that we had here on October 8th uh, with a, a number of our senior leaders just sharing their stories. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, our journey about listening. Uh, and this year, there have been so many things that have come at us. I know you're all feeling the pressures, um, not only as we think about the diversity and inclusion opportunities, in fact, but just really what's happening in our world and thinking about how we keep our business moving forward uh, under the COVID uh, challenges. So. Um, but this year has also been a real pivotal year for us too. And I was excited to be able to share some of those things as we move forward. So again, I don't have slides. I'm gonna just visit with you. I'm gonna share a couple of key points and we can certainly make those available to you later on if that's something that you wanna have more information on. Um, also, feel free to send questions in as I um, am sharing things. If something comes to mind, we, we certainly will keep those in queue and make sure we address those at the right time too. Um, so. I could sip, step back and think about what have we done since 2002 as we thought about our diversity initiatives. And Claire, I loved what you had to say because learning is such a big piece of that and making sure you're really thinking and moving through, you know, just from the early development and training types of things you're doing to the really robust and more mature pieces. So I really loved what you had to say there too. So quite frankly, I would have a checklist of things that probably all of you have done. We do have ERGs. They started as affinity networking groups. We've had... Um, a council, a diversity council, we've done training, we've done um, a lot of different pieces around demographic data. And so all the things that you have really been probably talking about and creating in the checklist. And what I would say is I was quantify that as we have pushed out a lot of content and we've been all about trying to really help the organization and our associates really think about what diversity and inclusion means within this organization. Um, but last year, in 2018, our CEO, Michael Tipsord, signed on to the CEO Action Pledge for Diversity and Inclusion. And I believe it has about now over 800 signatures from CEOs specifically that are saying our company is committed to the concepts of diversity and inclusion. Um, so in 2018, he signed on to that work. And this last fall in October, early November, we attended a session in New York City, he and I, uh, where they had CEO sessions and then diversity practitioner sessions. And then we were able to come back together. Um, walking away from that session, um, I remember our conversation as we were debriefing the day, the things that he was really impactful for him, the things that he was hearing from other organizations. Um, but walking away from that, the one thing that really struck me was he said, you know, I keep hearing in every session how hard this is, and I have not felt it being hard. And, um, and quite honestly, while we've had difficulties along the way, our culture is really about respect and working well together. And there's an expectation of, 
you know, treating each other well and open environment. And so our culture really lends itself to a lot of the concepts around inclusion and diversity. Uh, so some of those pieces probably have not felt very difficult because it's just a part of who we are. We, you hear us talk about being good neighbors. We talk about the neighborhood and we talk about the State Farm family. So that is really very embedded in our organization. And so, but his statement really struck me because um, he was right in so many ways, maybe it hadn't been too difficult. But my discussion with him was, well, the truth is, we probably really haven't had the hard issues. We've not really addressed the hard issues. We've not really addressed race relations. We've not had some really powerful discussions. So we are also a culture, um, when you hear us talk about State Farm Family, we also talk about State Farm Nice. And that State Farm Nice is we say all the great things to each other. And there is a, an underlying piece of maybe not telling exactly how we feel about things because there's so many so much goodness going on. So there was this opportunity for us maybe to lean in a little bit more and really get into the hearty discussions that we needed to address around race relations, inequality, some of the things that maybe we had stayed away from. So I came back, was excited about, really I saw it as an open door to say, let's move forward with this. And we started building out a session and our first session was actually held in February of this year. Um, the, se the session that we had was really an opportunity. We called it the Day of Understanding. And it was the same day that the CEO Action for Diversity, they ask all companies to participate in some type of learning event. And ours was really just getting together a group of leaders that would really talk about their journey and just have a really honest discussion. Um, so we set the stage to do that in February. We brought in a panel of folks and we, um, we actually had some really good um, conversation. We had people that were really openly sharing about specifically what their journey had been, um, uh, their life journey, uh, things that they had to deal with their children from race issues, uh, personal issues that they've had to deal with, um, and some very, very open discussion. Probably the first time we've ever allowed that. And is also in addition to the discussion, we allowed for Q&A. So we allowed people's voice to be in the room and to share some of their experiences. We quickly ran out of time because people were so engaged in the conversation. Um, a couple things that we did that um, you'll hear as I close out today too is one of our learnings. We really set the stage for saying we are going to have respectful conversation here. And we don't expect you to agree or you may have a very different experience and things we're gonna share here, but we're asking you to be open-minded and to listen and we really set rules of engagement. And the way that I set the stage for that day was to say it was like riding a bicycle. And that when you first start riding a bicycle, you have lots of falls. Um, you know, somebody gives you a push, you go over one way, you uh, probably have a lot of scrapes in, uh, along the way. And that we were gonna have some scrapes along the way, but it was time for us to have real conversations about real issues that all of us were dealing with and that maybe um, that sharing the experiences. So really setting the stage, having the right people there, uh, making sure that we allowed for associate voices to be heard. And in that setting, uh, just so you know, two, the two topics we talked about were black history and racial bias in America and inclusive behaviors and being an ally. So that was kind of the theme of the session. We had over 4,500 attendees that came. Now we're an organization just under 60,000 associates. So we about had 4,500, which is one of the biggest gatherings for even some of our other large gatherings. So we're really pleased with that. We had some also what we called um, sessions where uh, we did some things on social media and had some events where people were able to have conversations in that way. We had some um, sessions where people came together and watched it together. We call them watch sessions, watch learning sessions. So groups were coming to talk and so they could have after um, the meeting, they could have some sessions as well. So it was really this entry point. And I have to say, I've been doing this for a long time. And um, this was probably the most nervous I was because it was a risk. We didn't know how people were getting at, gonna react, what type of feedback we may have, and we were really prepared for anything that potentially could come out of that session. But more than anything, what we heard was just an appreciation for the willingness to jump into the conversation that had been so needed and that we were not necessarily engaging our people with. So that was in February. And who knew that in March, things were going to start falling apart with COVID. So in March, we, um, we actually, over the course of just 10 days, got all of our 60,000 associates working from home, 
um, virtual working. We are still working from home primarily. We have some that are coming in the office, but a very small population. But after that, um, that February session, now we all disperse and we're dealing with other really major issues uh, in our world. Individually, people are having to deal with it uh, personally and then as an organization trying to figure out how to work in that setting. So, so at that point, I think we stepped back because we were getting so much demand to say, we really want to keep having these sessions, but you're trying to evaluate what other priorities are in the organization. Um, and we and so we kind of paused for a bit. We did some continued doing social media posting. We paused and we said, well, let's see where this moves to. Um, and then, of course, in May, we all know just the horrific incidents that happened in our country and to start seeing people stand up and say that enough is enough. We silence is no longer an option. We have to step out. And we had really set the stage with that early conversation to allow for some of that to happen. So in May, what we are really proud of is like many of you, our CEO um, at that point just said, it is time to speak up. We are no longer gonna stay silent to this. And he immediately put together communication that went to our associates. Um, and then he had an external speech and then he worked with our employees as um, our leaders to talk about what's going to be acceptable in our organization and what's not going to be as acceptable in our organization. And if I would say anything, that was really the turning point. Well, we were able to set some foundational pieces in February to start that early conversation and get some sense of what reaction might be. In May, once we started to have some very distinctive, this is who we're going to be as an organization and our CEO saying, this is what my expectations are and how we're going to be a light in our community. Um, that really was a very significant um, moving and shifting for our organization to move forward. And it really allowed us to say, okay, it is okay to keep moving forward, even in the midst of all the other issues we were dealing with as well. Um, so in that time frame, as that evolved, um, it gave us an open the door of the conversation to um, talk with our senior leaders to say we had been talking about the potential of a chief diversity officer. I had served in a role of leading our diversity efforts for a lot of years. We had never officially named a chief diversity officer for State Farm. And it really just opened up to say, OK, it's time for us. If we're going to take a stand, then we need to be all in. And, um, and I will say literally within 24, 48 hours, we had approval to name our first chief diversity officer. And we're really proud. Victor Terry has taken on that role starting in June and is just really moving forward very aggressively in kind of the future of what this looks like. Um, and so, you know, having some of those things in place allowed us to put that in there. And then beyond that, we were able to start building out some more listening sessions. So, in September, September 16th, um, we announced a new DNI Governance Council. So we were able to say we're going to have senior leaders in this organization that are going to provide oversight for the strategy and to be a, a voice to our CEO and our chief administrative officer and to help us think about how do we keep moving our diversity initiatives more aggressively forward. Now, if I would step back to 2002, just a really quick side note, from the very beginning, we had senior leaders very involved in the work. So every for every group, our communications team, we had our most senior leaders as sponsors for that work and they guided the work. For our metrics, we had senior leaders involved. I reported through the chief operating officer at the time. And so we have always had senior leader involvement, but this year it feels different. Um, it feels like there's a more of a connection to say, okay, we are all in. Our CEO has set the stage for us and there's a different expectation to say, we are gonna aggressively move down this point. And uh, we were able to name the governance council, which will actually be meeting here in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Then on uh, September 23rd, our new chief diversity officer held the next learning session, listening session. And this was specifically with our CEO and our chief administrative officer and the chief diversity officer. So Victor was able to have and, um, ad, and facilitate a discussion with just a small group, 35 associates, and they were from our ERG groups. Uh, we have what we call an ERG incubator group. And so they're kind of our idea generators, a subset of our ERG groups. And so um, they actually had a, a first unique session uh, with the CEO, and it was really just a time for the CEO and the CAO to really hear what are the issues, what should we be thinking about as we uh, continue to move down this path. And I wanted to share a little bit of the feedback that we received because it was just so positive. 
Um, basically, what they told us was uh, diversifying the company in leadership and professional technical roles. So seeing it, we believe it. And what we do have, and as we look at our data, it's pretty positive in our distribution and how we uh, have a lot of um, diversity in our leadership roles. The team was saying we need to see more and we want to know that there's an effort with that. Um, they also said that we want to encourage first line leaders to really know their employees to get, engage them and to really build on their natural gifts and talents. And so it was a call to action. We have a first line leadership council so we could take that back to them to say um, we have people that say we need you to be more actively engaged in this. They asked us to think about how bias is influencing decisions in our companies and something for us to take back and look at all the ways that bias could be built into things that we never intended it to be. Um, they told us they wanted us to require mandatory DNI training annually, just like we do a compliance training. They felt like uh, we needed to do that on a very regular, rigorous basis. And the last point that they shared with the CEO and the chief administrative officer was we need to continue these conversations. So that was September 23rd. That'll move then to the next session, which I said really changed my thinking about this today and what I wanted to share with you. Um, on October 7th, we held the second discussion, which was follow up to February. This was an open discussion to all associates and we called it the conversations worth having, social injustice and steps to making change. In this session, very similarly, now our Chief Diversity Officer, Victor Terry, held and facilitated a session to talk with a number, another group of senior leaders, executives in the organization to talk about their personal journey and to really to just be vulnerable and to share and to open up some of the conversation. For this session, so as a reminder, the first session we had just over 4,000 participants. For this session, we had over 8,000 participants um, and the, um, the event that we're hearing just from the feedback is so positive and seeing more voices in the room, hearing more people sharing stories. Uh, I attended was so moved by in a number of ways. One, because uh, it's just hard for me to believe we are still having these conversations about some of these individual stories and their circumstances, but it is real. And the second was um, that I was so incredibly proud of our organization for leaning in and allowing these types of conversations to have as well. Again, participant feedback has been incredibly positive. Um, we're allowing for a lot of follow-up Yammer sessions, which is our social media site, to just have this continued conversation. Um, and yes, there are people that don't like that we're having these conversation, uh, but we were prepared for that. And uh, we just lean back into the fact that we expect people to be respectful. We want you to be open to listening to others' perspectives. We're not asking you to all agree, but we will treat each other in a way that is expected to be in this organization too. On November 3rd, we're gonna have our second listening session with our CEO and Chief Administrative Officer. It's a little bit smaller group, a group of 25, again, of our ERG leaders, people that can still share some of those real stories. Um, and coming off this year, and as we look at this next year, uh, we're really excited about all that we're learning in this piece and what does that mean for us and how we reshape what we're gonna do from our diversity initiatives, all that checklist items that I talked about, what do we need to do differently to really move it forward? So um, just kind of in closing, and then I'll open up to see what questions you have. Um, we have learned really so much, and I, but I did want to capture a few big things that I think were really important for us. First of all, um, this has created such a great sense of pride, excitement, um, and really appreciation that the organization was willing to do this. Um, even if it has not been perfect, even if some of the stories that we're hearing are disturbing and some of the things that we know probably need to be addressed, absolutely, the overarching theme has been just this really the pride in the organization. Um, there are some, as I said, that still don't understand. And so they're asking, are these conversations necessary? And in fact, many are saying, is this appropriate conversation for a business to have? And, um, and it gives us an opportunity to understand what some of that underlying issues that we need to address, that we need to help people think about and recognize that it does exist and, um, and understand how we maybe can approach that. The third is uh, we really understand the importance of laying that groundwork of how they were gonna be respectful conversations. So we used um, the conversation ground rules from Catalyst. You can go out there and look, pull them up. They were called conversation ground rules. And I'm just gonna quickly go through them. Um, they're assume positive intent, engage in dialogue, 
dialogue, not debate. Hold yourself and others accountable for demonstrating cultural humility. Be open, transparent, and willing to admit mistakes. Embrace the power of humble listening. Create trusting and safe spaces. Um, and a little bit of discomfort is okay. And the last is commit to having conversations that matter by speaking up to bridge divides. So again, those were conversation ground rules from Catalyst that we just pulled over and just said, these are gonna be our ground rules for how we function. And so when we get feedback that maybe isn't as positive or people are questioning that, we can always ground ourselves back in this about how, what kind of behavior we expect in our organization. The fourth thing that we really have learned is that employees are engaged in the diversity and inclusion work. They want to be a part of the work, but they could have limited their engagement because they wanted to be safe. We are hearing a lot of that piece of, you know, I could do so much, but there's still this piece of safety and um, really willingness to go a little bit beyond that line. And so there's work for us to do to keep building that safe environment for people really to bring their whole self to work every day. And, um, but we were appreciative that people were honest with that as well. And the last thing that I would share is our communications and what we've done over these years and all, like I said, all the things we pushed out and made available and resources and, and um, events and activities and all the things that we've done, we've given a lot of information. But for me, this year has really been around this piece of actively listening. Um, not that we haven't sought feedback, not that we haven't tried to gauge where people were at and we had those types of discussions, but this year has been really a practice for us in listening. And that was really why I titled uh, this conversation today to just say, are we really listening? Are we hearing what they have to say? And how do you build that into the future um, to move forward? And so we're really excited about what this year has been. It's been a year of growth for a lot of reasons. Um, and it could have been a year where we would have backed off in the diversity work and said, listen, we have so many other things we're trying to solve. And, but it just unfolded so beautifully to say, no, it is the time to keep leaning in. It is our opportunity to do that. And we're really excited and just encourage you to think about what that can mean for you as well, too. So with that, let me just open up to see what questions have been out there um, and see. I think there's one question I'm going to take here. What prompted your CEO to sign the CEO Action and Diversity Pledge? Um, so for us, he was a relatively new CEO. Um, he's been with us for, I think, five, six years at this point. Prior to him, there had been a 35-year CEO, 35 years, and he was a successor to his father. And so we've been a family organization for a lot of years. And in his early years, when the CEO action came out, he was just a year into his role as a CEO. And we actually made the decision through conversations with him to say, we need you to settle in a little bit more. Um, and we think there's gonna be a time to do it, but, um, but we want you to, to know when we think it's time, we wanna come back and have that conversation. And when we came back in early 2018 and said, we really think it's time now, he was all in and um, it has been really good support that we've received from that point. And the session um, that we went to last fall, I think was really enlightening just to hear what other CEOs and other companies had to say too. So that's important. Okay, and a second question here with everything happening this year, how did you prioritize the conversations worth having? And I think um, I'm just going to go back to what you said. Honestly, we fell into it a little bit. And um, I, I think in this diversity work, you are all experts at this. Um, a lot of this is around being prepared for when the opportunity opens up. And uh, so when we knew and we had the February conversation to really just think about this was kind of a turning point for us, we had set the stage to say this is important and we were getting enough input from people to say, we need you to keep having this. Uh, we've just scratched the surface. There's so much more to be done. Had we not set that stage in February, I think it would have been really complicated for us to do this amidst everything else that was going on. Um, so my encouragement to you is maybe not this, this issue, but you know, as you're dreaming about what you really want to have in your organization, you're setting the vision and strategy for your diversity and inclusion initiatives for you know, year two, three, four, five years out, as you're building that out, start putting frameworks around those things so they're ready to go when the door opens. And that's really been 
a, a lot of our approach to things is really having things ready to go. And, um, and when they say go, we, there's no hesitation because if it takes you three, four, five, six months to get it ready, the time has passed. And so as soon as we're told we're ready to go, we have enough to really drive it out. And um, that has been very um, useful and it's, it's been successful for us too. Okay, and then a question here, what does State Farm have planned to carry the DNI enthusiasm into 2021? And, and I hope you sense that level of enthusiasm and excitement about where we're at. And as I said, our new chief diversity officers come in and just really taken a lead on some of the work. And I would say some of the things that I know are really high on his radar as we move forward. First of all, we're launching the Diversity Governance Council. So that's gonna be here in the next um, couple of weeks. And that will really help us set the stage from the strategy work and what we need to move forward for 2020 more and more distinctly. In addition to that, uh, we're having a lot of conversations about more transparency. How else can we build transparency? Um, because this is about building trust and creating this environment where people um, want to be open and do feel safe. Uh, we're having a lot more conversations about what metrics should we be looking at. And uh, we've done some with metrics, but we think we have some opportunities. And then we're doing a lot of work with our talent strategy in thinking about how these intersect. And I think that that'll be uh, one of our big focuses areas for next year as well too. So if there are no other questions, uh, just in closing, I just wanna really encourage you all to think about the opportunities ahead of you, uh, to be prepared for those opportunities. We are proud of what we've done, but I can say we know there's a lot more to be done and we're all in and we're excited about where we take it next. So thanks for the time today too. Of course, thank you so much, Annette. And I know that I got a lot of personal notes and I think that one of the biggest takeaways that, that you said that really resonated with me personally is that this year is a practice in listening. Mm -hmm. I think that that is, is a huge sentence, I think, for, for given what everyone is going through. So I, I, I thank you again. I, I think everything has been wonderful, lots of wonderful notes. And if anyone has any questions that popped up um, or will pop up after the session, feel free to uh, go to the lounge, you know, send a message to Annette and be able to connect with people as well. And another reminder, um, all of these sessions are recorded and will be available about 24 hours after the event um, on demand. So use your credentials for today, log back in and be able to watch anything you missed or rewatch something that you need to take a, a second look at. So thank you so much, Annette. I will you. wish you a wonderful rest of your day and we'll get ready for the next session. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And upon looking at my notes, we actually have a brief break. We will be back here at 245 Eastern. And for right now, if you want to take a break, grab a cup of coffee, come back, please take a look at our exhibit booths. A uh, special thank you to all of our sponsors today, Blue Ocean Brain, Mersion, Thought Exchange, Practica Learning, Leading Now, Striver, and Wiley. You could go and be able to request eBooks and other materials and uh, request new and additional information. And then also we'll see you back in here at 245. Our next session is very unique. It's titled How Human in the Loop VR Simulations Crack the Code for Effective Diversity Training. So if you have some interest in VR, definitely tune back in at 245. And with that, I'll let you guys take a break and we'll see you soon. <laughs>